Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. As I always like to say, it's a pleasure to be here because it's always a pleasure to teach the Word of the Lord. So tonight, we're continuing on with our series from the Book of Revelation. This is lesson number nine. And in lesson number nine, we're looking at chapter 10, uh, which the title in the Bible itself is actually the same title as for the lesson, The Angel and the Little Scroll. Now, in the previous lesson, from Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9, Jesus opens uh, the seventh seal and after a half hour of silence, first one angel hurls the golden censer with a catastrophic natural outpouring of God's power, warning the people on earth of seven more angels with seven trumpets will come and unleash God's devastating consequences upon the planet and its people. So I just want to make clear here, because we've had a lot of sevens, there's seven seals, there's seven angels, and there's seven trumpets. So when we're talking about the previous lessons and the previous chapters, we're referring to the opening of the seven seals. And from those seven seals, we have events that happen. And from those events that happen, we have seven angels who will blow seven trumpets. And each of these are equivalent to a new message or action that comes from God. And so we've we've passed the seven seals now, and we're now looking at the seven trumpets. But in this lesson, like we've seen before, there's a pause. And so I'm actually going to start tonight by giving you a bit of a summary of, of where we've been, just to sort of get your head around the journey, and then we'll pick up from the beginning of the chapter. Um, but if you would like to learn about these, I'm going to refer you to the Jesus Movement website uh, and or the Jesus Movement YouTube channel. And I'm just gonna put up a screen behind me so that you can see these addresses. So you can go to our YouTube channel, type in Paul Brunson, the Jesus Movement, and go to the playlist called the Jesus Movement Live and each of these lessons from the book of Revelation are there. Or alternatively, you can go to the website, type in thejesusmovement.com.au, and likewise, it'll, it'll take you to all of the same videos. Now, on the bottom of the screen here, just so that you're aware, we actually have a presence on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Pinterest now, on Instagram, on Facebook, and of course, our own website. So there's a lot of, effort being put into giving you a platform. If you go to Pinterest and type in the Jesus Movement, again, each of the lessons are being put on there. You can click on the link, it'll take you to the YouTube channel to watch. If you click on the link at web, on the website, you can either watch it on the website, or you can click on the link and it'll also take you to YouTube and you can subscribe. And so these are all vehicles that we're using to fulfill what Jesus commands us to do. And that's to share the gospel into the four corners of the world. And so we do that by electronic media, as well as by those who are with me here. So I'm going to, as I said, give a bit of a review. So to start off, the word revelation means to reveal, reveal or to unveil. So same meaning. And it literally pulls the veil back between the physical and spiritual world like no other book of the Bible. And that's what's significant in what we're at now, because we were definitely looking at the physical realm and the physical realm is revealing what's gonna happen in the future in the physical realm, okay? So, so John is looking into the spiritual realm and he's hearing and seeing what's gonna happen in the future in the physical realm. And in tonight's lesson, you're gonna realize that he's actually gone back into the physical realm because when we talk about the angel the angel actually comes down from heaven to john and so this tells you that there's been a shift or a break in this process of time in which these visions are being revealed to him so <clears throat> as you peer into the invisible spiritual world you will see more than ever that you can uh, so than you can ever conceive in your imagination and so this is what this does. We're being told about things which we don't have any experience or knowledge of. And we're having things described to us where the Apostle John says that they look like something 
in order to give us an insight into what it's like. So the most significant reality that you see in the book of Revelation, of course, is the glory of our triune God, because it talks about God as the Father, God as the Son, and God as a Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, God the Father is seated on a throne of eternal glory. God the Son, Jesus Christ, is described as a lion, a lamb, and a high priest walking among seven golden lampstands. God the Spirit is described as a sevenfold light, blazing or shining as a lampstand with the fire of holiness. Now, there's no book in the Bible that so powerfully reveals this hidden nature of our triune God as we read here in the book of Revelation, because there's a constant interchange between the different characters of God. We see that there's the throne room with God, the Father sitting on it. We see that Jesus is there before him. And we also see these representation, these blazing lights that represent the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit is an invisible being, so to speak. So we try to get our head around all those things. And of course, the book of Revelation also reveals that there, that there are incredible other beings. And we basically understand that there are angels at the end of the day. But the descriptions of them are something like we have no comprehension of in this world. So in this lesson, you're going to encounter another angel who the Apostle John not only witnesses, but has a personal interaction with. This encounter sees John given a commission from the heavenly realm to fulfill here in the physical realm of this world. Let's, so let's take a moment to reflect on why the disciple Simon Peter was told by Jesus that John would live longer than him in John chapter 21 verse 22. And to do this, I'm going to provide you with a summary of the book of Revelation so far. And of course it commences from the point where Jesus called to John and told him to come up here, meaning come up to heaven in the spiritual realm. So the Apostle John, we have to understand, is an instrument, a human instrument, because there's a spiritual realm, who's chosen to write and deliver the book of Revelation. So when you reflect on the end of the book of John, where Simon Peter says, what about him? Jesus already knew that this task was assigned for the Apostle John, and hence the words that relay the fact that he would outlive Simon Peter, and hence the words of Simon Peter saying, what about him? And so we see that interplay. Now, he was exiled on the island of Patmos, uh, a Greek island, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. On that barren little prison island, Jesus communicated a revelation of himself to John, John heard his voice and saw a door standing open to the heavenly realm. Jesus called him to ascend from earth and go through the door into the heavenly realm. John was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do this, and he is promised he will be told things about the future, as it says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, I will show you what must take place after this. So this is the point in the book of Revelation that points that everything comes after that is something in the future in other words it hasn't happened yet so everything that we're teaching now hasn't happened yet okay so as he went through the door the first thing he saw was a throne in heaven with someone seated on it this throne which was the throne of the almighty god is the central and most important reality of the universe and you may notice as we've been communicating and teaching from the book of revelation since then that god is always positioned on the throne jesus is always positioned before the throne the angels are positioned some around the throne the elders are positioned on 24 other thrones and then there's a huge angelic host that are outside of that again but the center is god the father on the throne, sovereign, king, ruling the universe. So this, so it shows the glory of God who is seated there and celebrated as the glorious creator of the universe. 
He is worshipped there, as I said, by 24 elders seated on their thrones, four living creatures, and an extraordinary number of 100 million angels. In God's right hand, as he sits on his throne, is a scroll that he holds in his hand that's sealed with seven seals. A mighty angel called out in Revelation chapter 5, verse 2. Again, I'm just running a summary. Uh, you've done all this. It says, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scrolls? In other words, there's, a, there's an open invitation. And no one is found worthy. And we read in the book that John begins to weep. But Jesus appears portrayed as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and also as a lamb looking as if he had been slain. He is worthy, and we see the praise and worship that comes from that, and we still sing those same words in our worship songs to this very day. So he takes the scroll from the right hand of God, the Father on the throne, and when he does so, cascading worship erupts in heaven for Christ the Redeemer, who by his blood has purchased people for God from every tribe, language, people and nation and it's that and that only that makes him worthy to open the the scroll with the seven seals now moving on to revelation 6 chapter 6 jesus breaks open the seals one at a time and as he does judgments come down upon the earth the four horsemen of the apocalypse ride on the surface of the earth bringing judgment and suffering and of course there's martyrs people who have been slaughtered for the testimony of christ who are positioned underneath the altar of God. They're crying out for justice and vengeance. The sixth seal brings the end of the physical universe as we know it, in which the sun, the moon, the stars fall, and every mountain and island is removed from its place. When the sixth seal is opened, the inhabitants of the earth flee from the wrath of God, looking for refuge. They cry to the mountains and to the hills in Revelation 6, verses 16 to 17, and they say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So there's a reference always to God the Father and to Jesus. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? This is an incredible question that we need to heed, and one that we need to heed right now. So you need to ask yourself, where can you hide from the wrath of God? And so this is the situation, no matter what's going on in our lives, if we put all the noise aside, all the problems and all the journey aside, you've got to ask yourself, where's your relationship with God? And so in the things that we do today, are we walking in fear or are we walking in trust? Are we obedient to God? Do we pray to God? Do we know God? Do we read his word? Do we share his gospel? Do we help others? So in other words... It's a action, so our faith is an active thing. It's not something that we just learn and listen to. And so God is saying to you, you know, you can't hide from me. When this day comes, you're either with me or you're not. And so this is something for us to heed. Now in Revelation 7, it then answers this question about where you can hide from the wrath of God. And of course, the answer to that be a hard question, I think. It's a simple answer for you. Where do you think you can hide from the wrath of God? How's the only way you can do that? By the blood of Christ. Right. By the blood of Christ. So we call Christ our refuge. Okay? He, he's somewhere that we can shelter from God. Not from God, from God's wrath. So those who flee to Christ, including the 12,000, who are sealed from each of the 12 tribes of Israel and a multitude greater than anyone could count from every tribe, language, people and nation seem to be the answer to the question who should be able to stand because obviously there are those who can. We who are sinners will be redeemed and saved by the blood of Christ and we will stand fully forgiven in white robes celebrating the salvation that God alone can give. And white robes represent... Purity and righteousness. So the purity connected to righteousness, which means that we no longer are affected by sin. So we can stand righteous before God, covered by the blood of Christ. Now the Lamb breaks open the seventh seal, so of course Jesus, as Revelation 8 begins, which contains seven trumpets of judgment. 
as they start to flow, a level of suffering and judgment on earth will begin to flow in a way that we can hardly imagine. The first four trumpets in Revelation 8 are terrifying judgments on the ecology of the earth. So firstly on the green vegetation, burning up all of the green grass, a third of the trees and a third of the earth. Secondly, on the oceans, turning a third of them into blood and killing a third of all the aquatic creatures in the ocean. Thirdly, on fresh water, turning a third uh, to poison so people cannot drink it. And that was with the wormwood that we spoke about. And fourthly, on the sun and the moon and the stars, reducing their light by a third. So in other words, heaven and earth will be affected by this judgment. Moving to Revelation 9, the fifth and sixth trumpets unleash a demonic horde who come up from the abyss, which is a shaft deep in the earth. It is a demonic assault on the human race likened to a plague of locusts and the attack of scorpions. People are in agony, it tells us, for five months, but they will cry out for death, but they will not die. They will just suffer. This is then followed by an invasion of an army, which the Bible tells us will be 200 million strong. And we're talking about an army from the heavenly realm, not from the earthly realm. So, and by so doing, there's going to be a death that comes to one third of Earth's population. Just a quick question. We mentioned about all these thirds all the time. Why is it that only a third is being destroyed all the time? So on earth we have three thirds making a whole in that sense, but in heaven as well we have a third. So it's God's mercy and love. So in other words, his intention is to send a broadside shot that is going to wake the world up and have people come to him in repentance. But what does the book of Revelation tell us happens? People don't repent still. And so it's extraordinary. I mean, could you imagine existing in these times and knowing why it's actually happening and then saying, no, I'm still not going to change. It just shows you the place that the human race is, is in. So it is here that we come to Revelation chapter 10 where we begin our lesson now, where there's a dramatic pause in action before the seventh trumpet sounds. So I hope that summary is sort of helpful because it sort of just walks you through the book of Revelation. Now, it's similar to the pause between the sixth and seventh seal, where the respite is needed from the overwhelming judgments in Revelation 8 and 9. In this lesson, which is titled The Angel in the Little Scroll, John has a vision of a mighty angel holding a little scroll in his hand. It is already open, and the angel has come to commission John to speak future words of sweetness and bitterness that we desperately need to hear and eat. <clears throat> so you have pre-read this. Yes, we need to eat, but we also need to digest. And this is what the analogy is. We need to digest what is actually given to us, not only listen and hear. And we all know there's a difference to seeing something or hearing something and partaking of it yourself. And so this is the strong message. So the angel's message connects with the two witnesses, which comes in Revelation 11, which we'll examine in our next lesson. So please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 10. We're going to read verses 1 to 2 to start to learn about this mighty angel that we've spoken about. And so I'll put that reference up on the screen. Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 to 2. And it reads, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. So very strong and descriptive language. Now you may notice again, this is John speaking. And what does he say in some instances? He says he was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head but then he says his face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars so in other words they're not the sun they're not fiery pillars but he's trying to describe something so you can get a picture of what it looks like but the first two components he was robed in a cloud means that he's going to come in a cloud 
And secondly, it says there's a rainbow above his head, so it's categorical. There will be a rainbow that's seen above his head. So here is another angel described as mighty, believed to be a powerful warrior, ready to fight who is strong and able to do anything that God commands. Would anyone like to hazard a guess as to whom this angel is? Or do you think that that's something that we shouldn't do? Because this is what happens all the time with the book of Revelation. If I said there was a mighty warrior angel who was a messenger of God, who would you call that out as? Michael. Michael. Does the book of Revelation here call him Michael? No. It's, no. Saying, it's, it's saying it's an angel. Right. So there is some references that tie to this, but what I want to point out is that unless you find a reference that agrees with this or comes in the Bible to explain this, then we shouldn't assume anything. Okay? And so people like to know when, why, how, place names on things. It's human nature, but we need to stick to the scriptures. So we're going to go to the book of Daniel now. Uh, to a section that's titled End Times in Daniel 12, Daniel chapter 12. I'll put these references on the screen, they're only small. And it's Daniel 12, verse 1. So here's the two scriptures. And we're also going to have a look at Daniel chapter 12 again, verses 6 to 7. Why? Because they talk about end times, so they're connected to what we're reading now in the book of Revelation. So in Daniel 12, verse 1, it names the angel. It says, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. So that's the statement that actually puts a name to an angel. Again, it doesn't necessarily say this categorically the same angel. Then in verses 6 to 7, it goes on to say, one of them said to the man clothed in linen, because there was more than one angel in this situation, uh, without going into the story of the book of Daniel itself, it says, one of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, so this is how we know that they're not a human being, because they're above the waters, it said, and he said, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? So we're talking about end times, when he's talking about astonishing things. The man clothed in linen, again stated to be clear, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, which is whom? God, God the Father, saying, It will be for a time, times and a half time, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. And so both of these statements, or sorry, the first statement, sorry, the second statement, beg your pardon, is categorically talking about what's going to happen at the end times. This is an end times chapter at the end of the book of Daniel. So in the beginning of this end time chapter, it actually identifies that at this time that Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. So in other words, he's going to be a figure in the events that happen in the end times which we talk about in the book of Revelation. So they're the scriptures that point to the assumption that the mighty angel here in the book of Revelation is Michael and you can see the similarities. However, it still doesn't name this angel. So it's good to understand it may actually be Michael, but it shouldn't make us hung up. It, it's a detail that we don't, it won't make any difference. It's more about what's happening rather than who is doing it, like most things should be in life. So whether it is the archangel or otherwise, this mighty angel is depicted coming down from heaven to earth to give his message to John, meaning that John has to be back on earth in this vision after ascending through the door to heaven. So all the previous scripture that we've been looking at since chapter 4 tells us that John was invited to go up to heaven by Jesus and he witnessed everything in the heavenly realm. But this statement tells us, uh, without the timing, again, without the when, that John obviously uh, has returned back to earth. So um, perhaps the thing in this is that there is a, and you can tell this by reading this, there's a substantial amount of time that would be involved for John to see all these visions, even if they're in sequence. 
because the events that are being described that he's seeing are huge events and so they wouldn't be something that's momentary so it's almost like god said come and have a lunch break and we'll come back to you for the second round so um but that's the situation so i'm going to press you with a few questions now so the first question is the angel is described as coming down robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head his face is like the sun and his legs are like fiery pillars so what do you think the cloud represents it could be jesus because he in the scriptures it says he comes in the cloud with a piercing eye does it seem about Jesus he does comes, he come in the cloud. Yeah. But if you were to do a reference check on your Bible and look at the word cloud, for example, you would find that clouds are referenced many, many times, not in conjunction with Jesus either. Now, so any any more thoughts? You're not you're not incorrect. That's what are you talking about? The whole sentence. The well, cloud, the rainbow, the sun. Well, it actually says here, when we read this particular scripture, it says, then I saw another mighty, what? Angel coming down from heaven. If it was Jesus described in the book of Revelation. Think, no, I mean, it seems to be like representing Jesus, not that he Well, they're Jesus. all, the they all have a role to play. The rainbow sounds like the covenant. Right. And then You're jumping the gun, so let's go back to the cloud. I'm just but looking at very the good. cloud, the rainbow, <laughs> the sun. So it looks to me like the angels representing Jesus. Correct. I don't know. And correct. I don't know. Do, do, are the angels sent by God, by Jesus? Are they tasked to do things on their yeah. behalf? Yes. Do angels like humans have the same characteristics and qualities that God the Father has and Jesus has? Yeah. Yes. Are angels created beings? Yep. Yes. Can angels sin? Yep. Yes. Can angels beam in radiant light? Yes. Why? What happened when Jesus went up the mountain and met with Elijah and Moses? What does the scripture tell you? The face, the face is they were beaming this mm. white light. So what we see from there is that's not just Jesus, that there's others as well. So what we have to see in this is that there's characteristics that are exhibited as a consequence of God and they are of God, but they're not necessarily all attributed to one person of God or to an angel or to a human. In this case, it says that it's an angel. And so what we're looking for here is what is the use of the word clouds normally associated with in the bible so can you give me an example of clouds in the bible for example i would say life source because like when elijah called on the cloud the rain cloud right um, Is it? there's been a famine right and, and so and so what does the cloud then represent oh, you're talking about the physical is output so one sec so you're talking about the physical mm pouring of rain coming from a physical cloud but the the bible tells us that there had been a famine for three years and then suddenly elijah calls on the lord and the rain comes from a cloud yeah. what does the cloud represent uh, god's um, timing god's timing god's power god's Judge. judgment because this had been a consequence of god's judgment no rain no clouds and so when elijah calls on god and the clouds come and the rains come it is a consequence of god's judgment it's a consequence of god's punishment and then it transitions into a consequence of god's love mercy and provision the common word through all of this it's all about god and so when we talk about clouds what happened what was one of the visual things that happened at Mount Sinai when God descended upon the mountain? Darkness. You couldn't see the top of the mountain because what was going on up there? It was covered in clouds. Now it also talks about there was visible evidence of God's power because there was lightning and thunder and tremors, all those sort of things. But these are all things which are associated with God's power. So often in the Bible, 
clouds represent judgment from God, good and bad, both. But it's all attributed to judgment. Now in Psalm 18, for example, God is actually depicted as coming with the clouds of heaven, it says. With the clouds of heaven. Where the active constituent, again, is God's wrath. And often the mention of gathering clouds represents the unleashing of a storm of God's wrath. In other words, it's like gathering an army or a power together to have a bigger outcome coming from it. So clouds, so we're not talking about the angel here, but we're talking about the clouds. What do they represent? So it says the angel, the mighty angel, is coming on a cloud. And so the cloud represents the judgment of God. So the angel is the messenger, the deliverer, but he's coming with the authority of God and he's actually going to de deliver God's judgment and then there's going to be an outcome that comes from that. So the next question which has already been cheat cheatfully answered, I don't even know that's an English word, jumped all over in, in anticipation but quite correct, <laughs> says what does the rainbow represent? So I'll Refers to um, the covenant, covenant that uh, God made with Noah. Correct. Okay, so the rainbow above the head of the angel harkens back to the time of Noah's flood, <coughs> where the rainbow was given as a sign of God's covenant to never again destroy the world by flood. I'm just going to ask these questions first, and then I'm going to stitch this all together for you. The third question is, what does his face appearing like the sun represent? Now, we already talked a little bit about the transfiguration and the and the glowing face. What is it? What do you think it represents? What does sun represent? Power. Power. Glory. Sorry, glory. glory. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's the physical world, isn't there, where we talk about the sun and how it light. provides light. life itself and light. Okay. So we've got that physical aspect of it. But there's also another, there's expressions that we actually use. And in fact, there's a ironic blessing, ironic meaning Aaron, the brother of, of Moses, and the ironic blessing. And one of the things the ironic blessing says is that may God's face shine down upon you. What does that say to you when God's face is shining down upon you? He's protecting you. And, and yeah, looking upon you with right, love. right. He's dad. He's daddy. He's smiling down upon you. He's shining down upon you. You look up. I mean, it's like being a child, and you look up at your dad, and when you haven't done something naughty, <laughs> and he's shining. He's beaming. He's he loves you, and he cares for you, and he wants to protect you and nurture you. And so this is what we can look at from this. So the first two components of this description so far tell us that there's a coming wrath from God's judgment that is written on this scroll, hence the clouds. And But it says that it will not destroy all the earth because of the covenant. So they're the two things. Judgment, cloud, covenant, meaning that the consequence is not going to be the full destruction of everything on the world. And when a face is described as appearing like the sun, it is a sign shining with the radiance of God that displays his love and mercy is still available to any who choose to repent despite the coming wrath. So in other words, this angel's coming for a purpose. He's not going to kill everyone, but the shining face says, I'm here, this is coming, but it's not too late. You know, God is still smiling at you. God still loves you. He wants you to repent. So even whilst the next step is on its way, God is still giving people a chance to repent. And we learn in these scriptures that there's those who die during the time of tribulation, but go to heaven. So in other words, they've repented even though the tribulation has started. And so all steps all the way through the book of Revelation, it's not about God just coming in and casting everything asunder. It's about God saying this is ch this chapter, if you will, the world as it is full of sin is going to come to a close and I'm going to do all of these stages, these systematic stages where hopefully people will turn away from their sin and they will turn to God once again. 
And so when he comes, he has a purpose in terms of John. But again, the message goes out that God's love and mercy wants people to repent and that the shining, smiling face represents a God who loves all of his creation. So we have to remember that. Now the fourth component, what does legs like fiery pillars represent? What do you think about that one? Well, fire, fire represents um, uh, like the truth of the uh, like refining. Right. And yeah. pillars, I would say, was the, it's sort of um, the rule is set. Okay, that's good. Any other thoughts? Fiery pillars. Take that word in your mind. What pillars of fire? Can you remember an, an, a part of the Bible where it tells you about pillars of fire and there's also pillars of another kind which we've already mentioned and that's pillars of Lumps. cloud. What's a what's a portion of the Bible where we hear about pillars of fire and pillars of cloud? Do you know what it is? I know I'm being so mean tonight, and all these pressing questions making you think, making you know your Bible. What happened when the Israelites were released by the Pharaoh of Egypt? Oh, during the day, there was a, a, a pillar. Uh, the cloud is the day and the night is a pillar of fire. So what happened when they left Egypt the first time? There was actually both. There was a pillar of fire in front to light up their way mm -hmm. and there was a pillar of cloud behind to block the path of the Egyptian pharaoh and the 600 chariots who were coming after them. Mm -hmm. Okay, So they both served the purpose but the point is they were a pillar of God's presence and power so legs like fiery pillars are like the pillar of fire or the pillar of cloud and this is a great example to use that led the israelites into the wilderness the pillar of fire kept the pharaoh and his 600 egyptian chariots away from the people of god and it protected them and led them through the dark night and through the red sea you can liken this and you may never have thought about this but it can be likened to a picture of death and then resurrection so we think about the dead, the Red Sea. The enemy was killed and God's people were saved. So what happened? They left, they crossed in the dark, but there was a pillar of fire to light their way and to lead them across through the water, the parted water. And, sorry, just one moment. Uh, the enemy was killed and God's people were saved. They left and crossed in the dark and they were given the freedom of a life to live again when the sun rose the following morning. So they came up the other side. Remember, it was in the fourth quarter. They left in the dark. They arrived in the light. The pillars were there. Once they were across safely, the waters came across them. Now, these pillars continued to be active. I mean, when they were throughout the period of the time in the wilderness. So in other words, God was with his people. He was protecting his people. Okay, so the fiery pillar gave the light they needed to fulfill the task at hand. And so it is that the fiery pillars of the angel will provide John, because he's taught here to see John, what he needs for the task that he is about to be given. So in other words, he's got God's protection because he's going to be asked to do something, which is actually um, a, a risk, I guess, in terms of what he's going to do. So we'll come back to that. Okay, so let's now move on to Revelation verses 2 to 3 from chapter 10. And it reveals the angel is holding a little scroll that is open in his hand. So Revelation chapter 10 verses 2 to 3, beg your pardon, I've left the 10 off there. And it says, he was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of seven thunders arose. So here we go again. We've got another seven happening once again. Why do you think the seven keeps repeating? We talked about the meaning of the word seven. The word seven is used in the Bible to mean complete. complete. So the seven days of creation, everything was done. Mm -hmm. So what do you think every time it says seven in the book of Revelation, what do you think it's telling you about what's happening in, in that moment that they're describing? 
It says that everything that's happening is going to be complete. So in other words, each of these stages will run their course and then they will be finished. So in other words, they're not just going to keep rolling on. This will happen and then they stop. And this is what happens. We find as we're reading the book that there's these series of events that are going to happen. But they draw to a close and then the next thing happens. A good example. It says that the locusts were going to cause suffering for how long? Five months. And then what happens next? The next stage is that people were going to die. So what I'm saying there is that there's a defined event with a defined endpoint in that. And so this is what happens. Because God could unleash these locusts and despite whatever is happening, they could just keep rampaging around, I guess. But he doesn't. Because each stage has a purpose in which God completes that purpose before he goes to the next one. It's almost like going into the military, isn't it? Right? They take the human being that walks in off the street with all the problems, all the things of life in them, and they break them down to a fundamental robot, and then they, by stages, they recreate this person to function in the military. I won't go into all the details, but there's a process that's actually happening there. And you know, if you've been in the military, that you basically have to complete one stage before you can go into the next stage, and there's a reason for that. And so it is with training, you know, if you're going to a job. You need to be able to complete and fulfill and demonstrate you can do something before you go on to the next thing. And so this is a process that God uses as well. So the mighty angel here is holding a little scroll which lays open in his hand. And so this scroll is actually the point and the focus of this whole vision, this chapter that we're looking at now, and the reason for the angel coming from heaven to earth. To be clear, this is not the scroll sealed with the seven seals. I'll ask you why. Why can it not be the scroll of Jesus? And this also tells us that this is an angel rather than Jesus. Because it's in God's hand. Well, Jesus' hand. Right. The scriptures tell us that only Jesus was worthy mm. to take off the seven seals and to read that scroll. Only Jesus. And so we know that this scroll, and it also describes it as a little scroll, so it's like a, it's not got the whole message or the whole story on it. So maybe it's a portion of the same message that God put into the scroll that Jesus has, or maybe it's a separate message altogether. But it's directed at John. And so this message, if it's on a scroll, that means it's come from whom? Come from? God the Father. God is the author. God is writing and God is setting what destiny looks like. And so we know from this, it's a little scroll, it has a message from God and it's directed at John. So John is called with great purpose, not just to write this book. Writing this book is one thing, but think about what the purpose of the book is actually for. And John's been called to be given that responsibility for every person of every future generation. It's a huge calling upon him. And so <clears throat> we'd have to understand from that that John is, you know, uplifted. He's an exalted human being in God's eyes, in the eyes of Jesus, because this role has been given to him. Okay, so very, very important. So to be clear, this is not the scroll seal of the seven seals because only Jesus is deemed worthy to remove the seven seals and read the contents. This is writing from God and it is available to be read by someone other than Jesus because it lays open in the hand of the angel so John can read it. This shows that God is re willing to reveal some things to us about the future. So if we take a moment to reflect on the prophet Daniel, he was told to seal several of his visions for the future because their meaning would be hidden until the right time. Do you remember if you've read that? So this is a very important idea, and the book of Revelation is written often in difficult language, because we're always explaining everything, that can be hard to understand, 
But can you imagine that God actually intended it to be this way? If God wanted to write it in such a way where it was completely transparent and easy to understand, he would have written it in that language. But it's not. So it's like it's like being drip feeded. You get a certain amount of information, but you don't get enough to know the whole picture. So we're going to um, ask this question of you now. Why do you think God made it difficult to understand? See, we can explain and teach what the book of Revelation says, but there's lots in the book of Revelation that we don't know, we've never experienced, and there's things in there that are actually not explained whatsoever. They're presented to us, we get the imagery of it, but it doesn't say what's said. It doesn't say what's written on the scroll, for example. We know there's a scroll, we know it's going to be given to John, we know Jesus has a scroll, but nowhere does it say what's in it. Why do you think God does that? We find out when we get to heaven. What about people in the future, beyond us? Isn't it as 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 the time comes, then people will understand it? You know, like if you look a thousand years ago, we actually can see things happening in the end times. Right. Whereas a thousand years ago, they probably wouldn't understand what we understand now. I agree and disagree with you. Oh. No, no. <laughs> I agree because people are and do today and have always aligned what's happening in the events of the world in that time with the book of Revelation. So absolutely correct. However, at the same time, we find that before the book of Revelation was written, that there's actually people, and we'll touch on these, that are actually asking questions already before it even gets there. Okay. So we have those who are between us and when it was written. We have those who actually question things before it was actually written. Book of Daniel, for example. The time of Jesus, for example, with his disciples. And then there's the unknown, and that's the future generations and what will be revealed to them. Now, the fact is, is that the revelation itself doesn't change. But the alignment with the era that we live in constantly changes. So you see, a, there's a purpose in that. It certainly makes people talk about it, doesn't it? <laughs> if nothing else. So God could have re revealed, as we said, much more to be written in the book of Revelation if he chose to. But he provided a vision to the Apostle John so he could write a message that would be relevant for the church for a period of time with particular details that will only be relevant for the final generation. So this is our challenge, right? Because we're trying to second guess what we don't know. Every generation, just like us, can read it not knowing whether they, and this is the key, whether they are the final generation. How many times does a sermon start or a message start or a prayer start with in these end times, it's probably the most paraphrased statement that you hear today, in these end times. So in other words, people are aligning themselves, believing that this is the generation and this is the time. You know, some of us have been in the church where we were told it was happening in 2026, so we've got four years to go. But if we actually look at what actually has to happen in order for that to happen, with the knowledge that we can glean from the scriptures, it's very unlikely. But a few years ago, it was hallelujah, praise God. And so it goes on. So we don't know whether we're the final generation or not from reading the book of Revelation. That's number one. And people can perceive future things without knowing the full details that are yet to be revealed. So this is what people do. They try and stitch it together and say, oh, this means this and this is when it's going to happen. I've done all the numbers and the calculations in the Bible and this is when it's all going to kick off. But we see this here in this chapter because the scroll lies open and we are only given what God is willing to reveal to us right now. That's the key. What we're receiving is what God wants to give us now. So we shouldn't be perturbed by this. So let's take Daniel for example. I'm going to go to Daniel 12 again, verse 4 this time. 
And in Daniel 12 verse 4, this was said to Daniel, But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. So in other words, there was things that were said to Daniel that was written on a scroll and was sealed up to be revealed at the time at the end. So in other words, there's things in the book of Daniel that was told to Daniel that we don't know today. And that was past. But God helps he has a purpose in this. He was telling Daniel, and Daniel put this in a scroll, but it wasn't something that was revealed to us as a general message. So in other words, there's a reason behind it. Daniel did not understand the meaning, but he was told it was not for him, but for a distant generation. <laughs> it's one of the things, like, if someone gave you something and said, all right, I mean, it's probably the worst problem, one of the worst problems in the world, isn't it? I'm going to give you this piece of information. I want you to tuck it away and never speak about it with anyone. It's confidential, it's secret. How well does that work in this world? I mean, it's spilled everywhere, isn't it? I mean, human beings cannot hang on to something and remain private about it. Some do, but unfortunately most will spill something or other. Okay, very, very hard. And so God obviously trusts Daniel because he's given him something for the end of days that was written a long time ago. And it says he doesn't understand it. But the reason why the reason I say he doesn't understand it, why? is because it's not relevant for his day, it's relevant for something that will happen in the future. Okay, Daniel could be told something about these uh, same angels like we're reading in the book of Revelation. Right, That wasn't around when he was around. But he's from the earthly realm, and so he could see those beings and not understand them any more than we can. But he could be told to write down something or what he sees, and then God says, I want you to put that aside. So it's very challenging to think this. So Daniel did not understand the meaning, but he was told it was not for him, but for a distant generation. So in this open scroll before John Light, oh sorry, so in this uh, open scroll, what it says is it's a revelation of mysteries that God is intending to grant to his people now, but there are future insights that will only come at the end of days. So in verse 7, and I'm just going to jump here, we're going to come back to this properly, but in verse 7 of Revelation chapter 10, which we're yet to come to, I'll just put this scripture on the screen. It actually says, but in the days when the seventh angel was about to sound his trumpet, so this hasn't happened yet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants the prophets. So we've just been talking about Daniel. There's mysteries that have been given to Daniel, which he doesn't know but they've been entrusted to him to write down, but then they've been sealed for the end of time. And so we see here in this scripture that God, that all the angel of God, is acknowledging that prophets in the past have been given words which have been sealed. They don't understand them, but they're for the future. Okay. So again, we walk in this mystery, don't we? The mystery, the mystery of God. So we're going to come and have a quick look at that as well. So in days that are yet to come, God will reveal more. But it won't be through <coughs> excuse me, a 67th book in the Bible. God's will will be revealed by events that can be identified by knowledge of what has already been written. So in other words, it will only be clear to you if you are in that final generation and it is happening to you. So these things that we don't understand or can't be described... If you actually physically see it or it happens to you, you'll be very clear on what's going on at that point in time. So in other words, God's writing some things for us now, and he's writing things for the final generation in the future. So moving on, this angel that John sees will take a mighty stance on the surface of the earth. Verse 2 to 3 says, He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. So the stance is the stance of a mighty warrior. He cannot be moved from his position. It is like he has been taken a stance on a battlefield. He's got one foot planted on dry ground and one foot planted on the sea. 
So the message that John brings encompasses every realm of God's creation. It will affect all the creatures in the heavens for the angel's head. So you think about all the scripture now. The angel's head reaches up to the clouds and his face is like the sun. It will affect the earth because his left foot is in the water and his right foot is on the land. So we have this reference to the heavens and we have the reference to the earth. So with the word of God lying open in his hand, small though it may seem, it will have a huge impact on all of these realms. Now Psalm, I'm, I'm not putting this reference on, but Psalm 33 verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. And Jesus says in Matthew 24 verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, you're probably more familiar with this, but my words will never pass away. So in other words, they're relevant today, yesterday, and for the future. Now verse 3 that we've just read says, The angel's voice is likened to the roar of a lion, whose shout is to be taken seriously, and when he does shout, the seven thunders speak. Has anyone heard of this term, the seven thunders, before, or know of another reference in the Bible? It's a bit of a, a, bit of a hard one, isn't it? So I'm going to give you an example of this to enlighten you. There is a good example of the thunderous voice of God, and it's described in Psalm chapter 29, verses 3 to 9. I'll put the scripture up on the screen. So Psalm 29, verses 3 to 9, in which the phrase, the voice of the Lord, is repeated seven times. The word thunder is used twice in association with God. So we have these seven thunders, or seven words of the Lord, and it says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. That's the first one. The God of glory thunders, and Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord, second time, is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic, third time. The voice of the Lord, fourth time, breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf. It has this word Syrian. It's actually an ancient word for Mount Hermon, which is right next to Dan at the top of the northern uh, end of Israel, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord, the fifth time, strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. So what do we associate with the voice of the Lord? The thundering voice of the Lord. There's an outcome for it all the way through, isn't it? They're saying that he's powerful and he's majestic and there's this association of thunder, but it says that he's Lord over everything in essence. right? If he commands it, it's going to happen. Whatever it may be. And so in this, we see this reference to seven variations on the voice of the Lord. Okay, so let's go to verse 4, Revelation chapter 10, verse 4, in which John is commanded not to write down what the thunders, the seven thunders say. So Revelation 10, verse 4. And it says, and when the seven thunders spoke, so when we read the word thunders, what do we think now? When the seven voices of God spoke... I was about to write, so this is John speaking, but I heard a voice from heaven say, which tells you again that the angel has come down from heaven to John on earth, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. So this is exactly the same message that Daniel received back in chapter 12 when he had his message about the end times. And so we see once again at a much later time that the same thing has been commanded and asked of John. So clearly, we cannot understand what the seven thunders are saying because we don't get told what the message is. Obviously, they speak intelligible words because John understands them and he could have written them down because the, he's told not to write them down. So obviously, he can hear those words. So they're the words of God. But the words are sealed up. John is not allowed to reveal these things that we could know so in other words, if he was able to write them down, we would be reading them in the book of Revelation now, but he's not allowed to. 
And I suspect that God clearly knows that people always take prophecy and then try and make it happen by their own strength. So in other words, God gives enough information, but not too much, because when people find out things about things in the future, what do people do? So if I give you something about something in the future, are you going to sit on it and be quiet? You want to pull it, bring you it want forward. to bring it forward, and we've experienced that personally. And what happens when people want to bring it forward? What happens? Well, it's, a, it's outside of the line of God. Right. And so they do it by their own, will. their own will and strength. We spoke about this on Sunday. And doing something by your own strength is a sin. sin. Why? Because God's not in it. You're placing yourself first. So we take the word of God, we believe it, and then we try and make it happen our way. And in the passage of doing it our way, we make mistakes and we do things the wrong way. And so it is for today in life, right? Sometimes we can pray or there's a situation happening in life and we hear from God and then we say, right, that means I'm going to go and do this. But your context is different to what God is giving you. So sometimes we go out believing it's a word from God. We do something, we take an action and what happens? It goes pear-shaped, something goes wrong. Why? Because you're doing it in your own strength, even though it's come from God. Anyone want to offer an example from the Bible? Yeah, Saul. Saul? When he was on the battlefield, instead of waiting for Samuel, he decided right. to build an altar yes. to God. Yes. Which he thought was okay, but he did it in his time and not right. in God's time. Perfect. What about King Desire? The Egyptians were coming to join the Babylonians to fight against the Assyrians when there was a change of power and Josiah stood in the way and said no you can't pass through the kingdom of Judah and he ended up dead and God had actually told him don't and the Egyptian pharaoh said to him I'm not here to get you he said I just want to pass through so don't fight me because I'm not here to harm you but Josiah stood in his way and ended up with an arrow on his back and he died and he was actually quite righteous wasn't he? right he was a very good king yeah. right but in that moment, he tried to do it his way. Mm -hmm. Another great example is when Jacob thought his son Joseph was ripped to shreds by wild animals because his brothers who had sold him into slavery, and this is what I want you to really think about, they sold him into slavery, brought back his colored robe with blood on it. So what did his father think? He was dead. Now, if you think about this and you think about God's plan, you'll really get the heart of what this is saying. For many years, and this is the point, there was a duration of time, Jacob was under the understanding that his firstborn son from Rachel, whom he loved the most, was dead, but he wasn't. So God could have revealed to him that his son was alive and flourishing in Egypt, right? But if Jacob had have gone early to buy him out of slavery, what would have happened? God's plan wouldn't have been fulfilled. Well, what was the first stage when he was put into slavery? He was in the captain's household of Potiphar. And then all the circumstances that actually happened to him eventually led him to become the ruler of Egypt, a side of the Pharaoh. He was second in command. And there was a time which we talked about in the, in the Journey to Faith series where he was actually the ruling the land because the Pharaoh was just a little boy with his mother. So he, he was in essence ruling and that's when his uh, brothers found him and that's when he brought his father. So imagine if his father had a heard that he was alive, his dad would have said, right, I'm going to go and get my son and tell them who he really is. Right? And he would have got him and he would have brought him back home. But then what would have happened? The famine would have struck and then what would happen? So in other words, the purpose for why God planted Joseph there wouldn't have actually happened if Jacob had have taken it into his own hands. And so the outcome would have been affected by this and God's plan wouldn't have been fulfilled. So these are just some things that are not for us to know now. This is an example of why I'm giving to bring clarity to what we're talking about. There are some things that are not for us to know now and we need to trust God has a purpose in it. Okay, so we have to know uh, enough 
to discern the difference between the two. Sometimes you get given information and you almost have to say to yourself, is this for now or is this something for the future? Should I be doing something about it or should I have wisdom, know that this is the case, but act on it at the appropriate time? Okay, so Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29 reminds us this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So if we're reading the book of Revelation, the things that God doesn't reveal to us belong to him. The things that he does reveal to us belong to us. And so we pass it on to our children and generation by generation we see that the 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 future uh, as god wants us to see it is known to each and every generation so we have to understand this that god's purpose is not necessarily to reveal everything to us so from this we can learn that god divides future things into what we definitely know is coming and those things that we don't know what's coming so every nation and language and king will hear about these things in this circumstance first through the rest of the book of revelation to us and second through the unfolding events of history so let's now move on to revelation 10 verses 5 to 7 in which it says when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet the mystery of god will be accomplished which tells us again that there is a mystery in what god has to still reveal okay so the scripture says then the angel i had been sta seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever so again he's swearing to god and who created the heavens and all that is in them the earth and all that is in it and the sea and all that is in it so remember earlier i said that, that analogy he's got a foot in either and his heads uh, in heaven so here's that that connection in this scripture and he said there will be no more delay but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet the mystery of god will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants the prophets so this chapter is actually a delay because he says when when this when this step is complete then there will be no more delay meaning that this is a delay okay so this is one of those moments where god pauses he sends the levels of judgment and he pauses and he's giving another opportunity for people to repent and to be saved but he says there's a mystery in this that will be accomplished just and again as he announced to his servants the prophets as a reference that there's things that were given to the prophets in the past and they were sealed in other words they're a mystery to us and so they're called the mystery of god so the end is irrevocably set in motion there is no turning back the mystery of god will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants the prophets but the question remains what mystery so for us we're always like what mystery what's going on so remember a mystery isn't something that no one knows it is something one can only know if it is revealed to them. So again, a mystery, <laughs> I'll make sure I say it right, a mystery isn't something no one knows. It is something one can only know if it is revealed to them. That's what a mystery is. So otherwise, it wouldn't be a mystery. All right? So if you could work it out or find it out, you can't call it a mystery. In other words, you can't discover a mystery. It can only be taught or told to you or explained to you. You can't find it yourself. So people who are guessing or telling you that they're going to reveal what is not known, which happens all the time with teaching about the book of Revelation, are certainly not revealing the word of God to you because God's words are in the Bible. So let me first address verse 6 in which the angel swears an oath to the Creator and he says there will be no more delay. But the unfolding of God's plan seems to take forever. So, so here we are, 2000, well, virtually 2,000 years later from the time when John wrote this, and people are saying, when's it going to happen? So it's a long time, right? You think, 
2,000 years, surely God could have sorted this out by now. So there's always the when question. And people keep saying the further that we get away from the time that Jesus was here, the closer we must therefore come to the end of days. Makes sense. But how do you know it's not 4,000 years? Or how do you know we're only halfway? Maybe it's 6,000 years. Maybe we're only a quarter of the way. But people keep pulling up signs, as they like to say, and saying this is the mark of the beast, this is this, this is that, and it's been going on for 2,000 years. Right? So we are not to know why, because it's a mystery of God. And if people knew, could you imagine if you actually knew how many cults have there been, especially I think in the 80s was a particularly rich time, where people would form cults, doomsday or end of days cults, and they would go and live in an enclave and get guns, and inevitably they end up dead. Why? And they think, well, it doesn't matter because the end of the world's coming. So we're not going to do what the law says. We're not going to abide by the laws of the land. We're not going to do anything that we don't want to do because we're reading the scriptures and we believe that the end is nigh. And so this is the consequence of people misreading the scriptures. Why? Because some of those things, you know, there was the one in Waco in Texas. There's, there's a string of these right? that happened here in Australia. And we're still here. So we just got to be really careful what we believe and what we do. So people always want to know when. In Daniel 12, one of the angels asked, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? We said this earlier. And in Revelation 6, one of the martyrs under the altar asked, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? So in other words, they're when questions. So back in the time of Daniel, and now here in the book of Revelation. So in answer to these questions, this angel reveals, after the events that follow the sounding of the first six trumpets, the time will be short until the end. So that's the relative scale that we get given. But that's obviously still in the future. So Jesus reveals in Matthew 24, verse 22, he says, If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. So Jesus is basically saying there's been an adjustment of how long that's going to be right interesting uh words right and for the sake of the elect and this is the point the elect are whom who are the elect the uh, children of israel the uh, jews are they who's jesus talking to is it unbelievers the elect are those people who are believers, Jews or Gentiles. Okay, so the elect, what that means is that they are already known. To know as God knows who's going to elect to be a believer and who isn't. Right, you elect to be a believer. You make the choice to be a believer. So you are part of the elect. And so the Book of Life says that it's going to be filled with a certain number of elect, which, again, we don't know. If we knew, could you imagine? Oh, there's a hundred to go. What would, what would happen in the world today if they said there's a hundred people left to put their hand up for Jesus? Chaos. <laughs> you can imagine, like, it's indescribable, isn't it? And so you can see why there's certain information that's not going to be given, right? Because they need to uh, have these elect... So, okay, so for the sake of the elect, those, these days are numbered and the number has been revealed to us, but we will get, oh, sorry, but we'll get back to this, yes, sorry, I'm correct. The number has been revealed to us, there is some numbers that are given to us, um, but we're going to get back to it in the next lesson, so in chapter 11, so I'm going to give you some feedback on this. Okay, so let's now address verse 7, the mystery of God. And the mystery of God means those things that are part of God's overall redemptive plan that have not yet been told to us because it's a mystery. 
The mystery of God will be accomplished in those days, the scripture says. So there is a good example of a mystery passage to be found in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. That's a nice description, hey? A mystery passage in the Bible. And it reads, And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfilment. So we're talking about end of days, end of time. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So that speaks of when Jesus returns. So you can start seeing when you start to align scripture that you've perhaps read before, you can see how it's connected to what's being said in Revelation. There's a lot of scripture which refers to it. And it gives you a new lens to read it with. So this is the mystery, the big picture. God will destroy all evil and bring everything together in harmony under Christ. All will worship and give glory to God. Now that's a mystery right now. Because how's it going to happen? Well, it hasn't happened yet. So all problems will be gone and we will live in harmony as one. The book of Revelation represents the final stage of the prophetic unfolding of the mysterious plan of God ahead of time. In the days of the seventh trumpet, the end of all the messages ever given, and, the, and we come into that in the next uh, lesson in chapter 11, the end of all messages ever given through the Old Testament, the New Testament, the prophets and the apostles will be accomplished and fulfilled. And the day of the Lord will come at last. It is to this end that the angel has come to recommission the Apostle John to finish writing the rest of the book of Revelation. So this is what's happening in this chapter. So let's read about this commission. So we go to verses 8 to 9 in our chapter 10 that we're reading. And it says, Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. So this voice from heaven isn't the angel. This is a voice from heaven, because the angel has come down to earth. And it says, Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel, so that's a third person comment, who is standing on the sea and on the land. So he's identifying this person, this angel, that he's to take the scroll from him. So I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. I will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth, it will be as sweet as honey. Right? <laughs> John's just going, okay, uh, what's going on? So John is commanded to take the little scroll from the mighty angel and eat it. It isn't just expected that John will read it. Normally if you've got a scroll or information, or if I'm teaching something, I don't say, okay, now you've made all your notes, I want you to eat it, right? you would normally just pen it down and you would store it somewhere for safekeeping. But in this instance, he says that he wants him to eat it. So the reason he wants him to eat it is because he wants him to digest it. So what we have to understand is what is the, the scroll representing? It represents the word of God. So he doesn't want him just to read it. He wants him to meditate on it and digest it. That's what he means when he says he wants him to eat it. And so by doing this, the angel says to John, what it has to say will be as sweet as honey in his mouth, but turn his stomach sour when he digests it. So eating God's word or prophecy happens a number of times in the Old Testament. And so I'm going to give you an example from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. And it reads, And he said to me, Son of man... Eat what is before you, eat this scroll. So this is not the first time this has been mentioned. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, son of man, eat the scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. He then said to me, son of man, now, so we go now to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. I'm not going to explain all that scripture because we just want to see that this is a terminology, this is something that they're commanded to do, and we do see these references coming in the same. So God, sorry. 
So in this instance, Ezekiel was told to go only to the Jews, even though they would not listen to him, hence the house of Israel. But the meaning of eating the scroll represents the total absorption. So this is what you need to understand. It represents the total absorption of the word of God into your inner being. So when you eat something, it goes inside of you, becomes part of you. Okay. So chewing it, swallowing it and digesting it, it comes inside and it fills you. So here in the book of Revelation, John is to take this message in his mouth, chew it up, digest it, sorry, taste it, digest it, and then he's asked to proclaim it. So in other words, he's got to receive it inside his soul, and then he's going to go out and he's going to proclaim this to other people. So the word of God to him is sweet in his mouth, but when he delivers it to those who are unbelievers or sinners, it is going to be bitter. And so we have a word that we use today called bittersweet. Some, for some people it's sweet, and for others it's bitter. This is where it comes from. Okay. So Psalm 19 says that God's word and his law is sweeter than honey from the comb. It is a beautiful picture, but John's experience, as I said, will be a mixed one. So he's been asked to digest it, and it's going to be sweet in his mouth, but bitter afterwards. So in other words, he's been commissioned to do something. He's not just been asked to have knowledge and to write it down anymore, because this isn't written down, because it's actually inside of him. He's been told to share it by this method to the people in his day. So this represents how the message of the book of Revelation is a mixed one for us, it is difficult to hear. In other words, there's things in here that we're going to like and there's things in here that we're not. So it would be very natural when you're speaking about the end of the world for people to have an instant fear of the unknown. Even if they're walking with God, just the unknown is something that people can be anxious or fearful of. And so we will take this with bittersweet. So the bitterness is related to the fact that many people are going to die under the wrath of God not as believers in Christ, and that this beautiful world that God made will be destroyed. Moreover, the process of going through that will be grievous. It will be difficult to watch. People will die unrepentant under the wrath of God. Then there is another sweetness that comes from knowing God's ultimate purpose is good. And in the end of Revelations chapters 21 and 22, which we'll come to later, it reveals that there will be a radiant church and a new world and a glorious experience with God. But before this can happen, there will be some bitterness to go through. Just like Jesus weeping over the destruction of Jerusalem, or the Apostle Paul feeling anguish for the Jews who refuse to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. All these events are bittersweet. Part of our journey is bittersweet. You know, if we have a person that we love and care about, we could be bittersweet about what we know and what they choose not to accept. Right? And so we could love that person, sweet, but we could feel bitterness in our stomach that they don't believe what we believe and that they're not going to go to the Lord one day. Okay, so finally, uh, the last portion, Revelation chapter 10, verses 10 to 11. It reads, I took the little scroll, I like how they say the little scroll all the time, <laughs> it's like a pocket diary, isn't it? From the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. So this obviously changes the person. So we, we shifted from it being given to what he's experiencing. Then I was told, and so here's the commissioning, this is his instruction. You must prophesy again, prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages and kings. And we've heard that expression uh, before. So in essence, we can say the book of Revelation from chapter 4 onwards is a book of prophecy from the Apostle John. Here in verse 11, John is recommissioned to preach or proclaim about many people, nations, languages and kings. In other words, this message is for the entire world and everybody in it needs to hear it. So John must write this message. John is called by God to do so and he has no choice. This message is especially important for the kings of the earth to hear because later in the book of Revelation, the kings of the earth will place their power under the Antichrist 
and gather at the Battle of Armageddon or Megiddo in Israel, as we know it today, to fight against the people of God, which in turn triggers the, re the return of Christ that we're going to cover in Revelation chapter 17. So you can sort of see all these things that are happening now are all going to lead into future things. So the kings of the earth need to hear this, but before these days come, there will be some kings who will hear and heed the message of the word of God and repent. And so a couple of scriptures from Isaiah. The first one says he brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground. Then he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. So this is telling you these are the kings that do not believe. But some kings and rulers, even in our day, and the Bible says kings, but we're talking about leaders. Right? In our day, it would be a prime minister or a president, for example, as well. But some kings and rulers, even in our day, will hear the gospel, repent and believe. And it says in Isaiah 52, verse 15, So will he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. Him we're talking about? Jesus. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. So in other words, the scriptures are telling us there is some who are going to repent and change their ways. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the chapter. So what can we take away from this incredible chapter? God is saying to you, I have more to say to you, and you need to listen to the rest. It will ultimately be sweet for you but there's going to be some bitter pills to swallow along the way. This message reiterates that God is always in control. So through everything that we're reading and learning, God is always in control. And he pauses as he progresses because he is merciful and loving to allow people to repent even as the calamity of destruction and death surrounds them. When this teaching finishes... You're going to walk outside and wonder, or well you can, and wonder, what on earth is that all about? Right? Why? Because you're going to go outside and it's going to look exactly the same as when you came inside. The trees are going to be out there, the grass is going to be out there, the cars are going to be out there. So in other words, we're reading a message which talks about something in the future which takes our mind into the future and it's a message that's hard there's bitter aspects to it but we can read this and take this on board and then walk outside and go oh, doesn't affect me because nothing's changed now so when you go out and you feel the breeze see the birds flying etc you can be tempted to think what is all of this that we are reading in the book of Revelation? And as a consequence, a lot of people choose not to bother reading it. Because nobody likes to think of the idea that what they know now sometime won't be here. And we are incapable of conceptualising what it'll be like, and the scriptures tell us this, that we have no comprehension of how wonderful the future looks when we are going to heaven and when the earth is restored, when we live a life without sin, without corruption, without suffering, where the things of this world, finances, property aren't an issue for us. So we can't conceptualize it. So it's very easy to switch off to this type of a message. So whether you think this or not, I guarantee you that non-believers are definitely not thinking these thoughts. This is not even on their radar. So you have to realise that as Christian people, that when you walk out the door, you have something inside of you, perspective-wise, which is completely different to a non-believer. And that's really challenging to deal with. So if they knew anything about these things, they would reject them outright and think that they are ridiculous. So imagine meeting a new person and say, Hi, I'm a Christian. I'm going to give you a Bible. I recommend that you read the book of Revelation first. <laughs> How would that go? Right, you can see, can't you? And so the book of Revelation needs discernment, judgment, wisdom, maturity, and it needs perspective. 
because we have to realize that it's something that hasn't happened yet. So we need to read the words of the unsealed scroll, the word of God, about the future that is coming. We need to take it to heart. We need to eat it. So this is my instruction to you. I need you to eat the word of God. Not literally, but you need to eat the word of God. You need to have it in you. You need to live it and breathe it. Chew on the cud. Chew on the cud. That's exactly right. And that comes through as the word says meditation, not the Middle Eastern type, but it comes through reading and dwelling and praying on the word. So in this instance, because the book of Revelation, we're saying to do that about the future, things that have not yet happened. So you need to say, I believe that everything I see with my eyes is temporary. Everything that I see with my eyes now is temporary. One day, it's not going to be here. It's not going to be the same. And one day, it's going to be destroyed by the wrath of God. And it's no big deal because he can recreate anything he likes. And this needs to affect the way that I live now. So in other words, if you're making all your decisions based on what you see in front of you, then there's a component in your life that is going to have a big problem. So it's something for, it gives us checks and balance because you know all the things that come against us in life, they're really right here in front of us. But we need to be able to see further ahead. Like Roger says, when I'm driving down the road, don't look at the bumper of the car in front of you, you can't see past it. Look a kilometre ahead, judge what's going on, and then when you can read the traffic, you can drive like crazy through all of them because you know what's going on before it happens, right? <laughs> so, I'm going to, so I'm going to close with a scripture from Second Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. And it says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Why do you think that means speed is coming? It could happen any time. Can you control that? Mm. Well, you can't control the whole thing, but you actually can contribute to that. Now, this might sound that I'm saying something different to what I've said in the past, but the book of life doesn't have an end date on it for a reason. And that's because there are people out there who may become believers, who won't become believers, because God calls us, human beings, to walk into the lives of non-believers and introduce them to God. So if everybody were good soldiers and did this regularly, then we could speed its coming. But if we sit back and don't contribute, even if we're believers ourselves, then the day of God will take longer. Okay? So there's things that are happening in the world, and we've spoken about them, which are part of prophecy in the Bible, but they won't speed the coming of God. But there are things in this world which we can do, which will determine how many elect are written into the book of life by what time. And the close of time will happen when the book is complete. Seven, number seven, when the book is complete. And so we can contribute to that. Okay? Okay. So, this is the Word of God. Everything that you're hearing is from the Scripture. So, I pray that this has uh, opened your eyes and made you sort of think about things. I think there's a lot of learning from this message that we can take on board and we can certainly change our lives as a consequence of it. And the tail end message is, you know, how are you going, how are you living your life? Because that's what's really important. You know, what can you do? Okay.
the end of times will happen, but there is things that we can do in the journey along the way. Truly satisfied